Darwin's Doubt reviews the first uh, installment here. Um, I'm going to start out by my own kind of quick personal philosophy on how to review a large scientific book. Uh, it seems like the number one thing you should do is read the book. That uh, should go without saying, but unfortunately uh, doesn't always, as we will see in one of our reviews in the future. Uh, I think you should find the main ideas that are being presented. I think that you should check them against A, your background knowledge, and B, uh, you should look up the references to key ideas that you don't really understand. And um, it might be helpful to look at uh, opposing viewpoints and see if they have comments about those particular issues. And that's one of the things that we're going to be doing today. And then assess the reliability of the key points. And then once you have done that, try to write a balanced, fair review, outlining what you know, outlining your own biases, where you're coming from, and of course, at the end state, your evaluation is this, of what essentially does this book do, should you look at it. Some will, and in fact have, argued that the procedure is this, to find the truth, evaluate one claim at a time until a pattern emerges. So you start at the beginning of the book, first statement, uh, you chase it down. Second statement, you chase it down. After you've done this for about 50 times, if you find that the person is reliable, I guess you kind of assume that the rest of the book is reliable, and that, uh, that you can take it pretty much at face value. Uh, if you find that the first 50 times are stating, as the review would put it, trivial or uh, incorrect uh, statements, then at that point you start saying, well, maybe the whole review, the whole thing is, is wrong. Uh, problem, well, we'll go into the problem that I have with that. Um, and. Uh, this was actually posted the month March 2012 by Garman Lethe at uh, Talk Origins. Um, and uh, by the way, I'm not picking this out of thin air again. This was uh, recommended by one of the, uh, actually by more than one, but uh, one in particular that uh, picked it up. You folks may remember Igakse. Uh, and uh, here's the Here's the comment that he made. Rather than just reading ID books and presenting their ideas during Sabbath school, I would like to challenge Dr. Geem to take this post seriously. Dive deep. I don't think he's doing it, and I certainly can't do it for him, but I also think that he's clearly intelligent enough to find the pattern described in that post if he can put his trust in people like Meyer on hold long enough to do it objectively. So anyway, well, here's the post itself. It starts out with kind of a background. Uh, Christopher comments, in part, I'm a creationist and I'm asking, since I consider talkorigins.org perhaps the best resource available for exploring point-counterpoint claims around the issues. I'm a little surprised at that statement because I would think that uh, talk origins may not be the very best, but um, whatever. Um, and then uh, Mark Buchanan says, whoever he is, um, glad to see a creationist actually taking the site seriously. The original post of this group in February proved to be quite an entrance and was quite interesting that at exchange change any of your thinking on genetics. Um, and then it says, it did absolutely, Christopher, it did absolutely demonstrate that the issue is not nearly as simple as any superficial take on it will ever allow. It has led me, in conjunction with other studies, to a certain feeling of, I don't know, intellectual despair, if you will. There's simply so much data, so many arguments, so many studies, so many criticisms, so many factors that the layman, who normally lacks technical credentials to even properly evaluate the data, simply feels helpless in trying to form an educated opinion. For every point, there are 100 counterpoints. For each counterpoint, raises 100 replies on its own. So while it is deeply fascinating to me, it frustrates me even more. 
and then the reply of the uh, post of the month because the way it formats came out where I can't just screenshot it for you. I've uh, copied it and pasted it. One of the great pleasures I took from grad school was learning how to get around this problem. I, I would have said how to solve this problem, but um, I am minor quibble. First caveat, we're now in a world where educated means having access to the library of a good research university and knowing how to use it. If I have access to a copy of, quote, linkage disequilibrium in the human genome, end quote, and you don't, it doesn't matter if you're smarter than I am. You have to rely on me to tell you what's in that paper. The digitalization of decades of the primary literature has amplified this disparity. If you want to evaluate claims and counterclaims for yourself, the price of admission is at least part-time university enrollment. That's actually not true because if you, at least if you go to Loma Linda University, you can go to one of their guest computers and you can get download stuff from nature or whatever and uh, look at it and uh, <laughs> you don't have to be a member of the university. You don't even have to have a card. You can be a bum off the street and do this. Um, second caveat, learning to read the primary literature is still is a skill that's easiest to pick up in a grad seminar class. You can figure it out on your own, but you'll have a lot more frustration and you'll make a lot of avoidable mistakes. So yeah, it does help to have graduate school training. I guess I got that. Um, each community will have an understanding of what can be assumed and what needs to be explicit and you'll have to read several dozen papers before you can start evaluating the quality of the work with any competence. If you still want to dive in, then read the abstract first, then the conclusion, then the introduction, then the discussion. You'll know you're getting good when you start skimming the bibliography early on to see if there are any papers or authors you recognize. So here's the trick. Pick one claim and master it. Here's how this works in practice. When you posted your query about Carter's genetics paper, I stopped reading when I got to his first citation. He made a claim that, quote, there is abundant evidence that the entire human race came from two people just a few thousand years ago, end quote and I decided to focus my efforts on that particular claim. So, you know, you're reading through the paper and here's a claim. That in turn led to Nelson's paper in the Journal of Creation. And again, I focused on one claim there and followed up the papers he cited, and that is Dorrit. Now, there I read Dorrit and read several of the papers that came later that cited Dorrit and improved on the work. I also had to consult an evolution textbook and a few Wikipedia articles to figure out what a few of the more technical terms meant. Um, having done all of that reading, do I understand linkage disequilibrium? No. But I have a general idea of what's involved. I have a decent sense that this technique is well regarded in the community and most important, I can see the error bounds decreasing over time. And based on this, I'm quite, quite confident that Nelson's claim about linkage disequilibrium was wrong. I then turned to Nelson's next claim, followed up by the citation to Reich, and figured out straightway that Reich didn't say what Nelson said it did. I don't think Nelson was clever enough to lie about this. He probably just didn't read the paper carefully. Uh, nice to have a little charity there. So let's take a step back. I've invested a few hours of highly technical reading to figure out that the first two claims of Nelson are wrong and that Carter shouldn't have relied on Nelson for support. Nelson makes a lot more claims in his paper that I didn't look at and I haven't even gotten to the meat of Carter's work yet. I could easily spend two months doing this kind of analysis on Carter's paper, and that's just one paper out of the thousands of creationist publications that are out there. I'm sure that was meant to be publications, plural. But all is not lost. After doing a couple dozen deep dives like I've illustrated above, you'll begin to realize that if a creationist makes a scientific claim in support of creationism, the claim is either wrong or trivial. After another couple dozen deep dives, you'll start to see patterns in the errors. And at some point, you'll be comfortable reaching the tentative conclusion that if the first 50 claims you investigated were wrong or trivial, 
then you can start making increasingly confident predictions about creationist claims in general. So, you know, once you've debunked one article, two articles, I'm not sure how many articles it will take. If you're 50 and you're doing 12, uh, maybe four articles, and you can just toss the whole bunch. Let's take another step back. You mentioned points and counterpoints. That's very much a debating approach. If you're talking to folks who don't have access to the peer-reviewed literature, that's probably the only model for conversation you have. You can enumerate your beliefs, and they can enumerate their beliefs, and there's really no way for one person to convince the other. The approach I've outlined doesn't have that problem. One, Nelson says Dorrit's linkage equal disequilibrium work supports a population bottleneck consistent with a worldwide flood. Dorrit was doing exploratory work, and his error bars were so wide that it supported a population bottleneck last Tuesday. Subsequent work that was available to Nelson, but he didn't use, uh, improved on this technique and it excludes a flood-related bottleneck. Nelson got it wrong, full stop. Nelson says Reich's population bottleneck supports a worldwide flood. I say Reich specifically mentioned that no bottleneck was found in the Nigerian population he studied, and I'm happy to send you a copy of Reich with the relevant passage highlighted. Nelson got it wrong, full stop. And that in microcosm is the evolution creation debate. To sum up, don't waste your time with points and counterpoints. Find a claim that interests you and run it to the ground. Then repeat. There are lots of folks here who would be eager to help. If you need a paper that's paywalled, drop us a line and it will magically appear in your inbox. If you like, write up your results and post them here. If you've picked a claim and have no idea where to start, drop me a line or post here. It gets a lot easier with practice. So this, that's, the, that's the post of the month. This, of course, is a general procedure. One can apply it directly to Darwin's doubt, and, and we will a little. Uh, but it seems to be an inefficient way of doing things because it's basically an attempt to see if we can discredit the author on points that may or may not be relevant to the discussion that he's raising. It's basically an ad hominem argument. He doesn't know what he's talking about, so ignore him. Now, if that's all we have, we may be forced to use it. It's certainly better than just simply point, counterpoint, what do you think kinds of things. It's at least attached to reality somewhere. But I'm reluctant to use it for the following reason. Um, there are two major negative reviews of Darwin's Doubt that are referred to by virtually everyone. One of them is Donald Prothero, and there is the web address. And um, those of you who get the email should have that. And the, Nick Madsky, and there is that web address. So Nick Madsky is one of the two key people. Well, Nick Madsky has an interesting history. Uh, he's a bright guy, and there are a lot of things that I respect him for. But uh, recently, and the web address is uh, right here, uh, there was a statistics question that was asked of Nick Mansky uh, by Barry Arrington of uh, uh, Uncommon Descent. If you came across a table in which was set 500 coins, no tossing involved, and all 500 coins displayed the head side of the coin. Would you reject chance as a hypothesis to explain this particular configuration of coins on a table? Seems like a fairly obvious question with a fairly obvious answer. Well, <clears throat> a little further on down, Mark Frank answers, chance is meaninglessly vague as a hypothesis as is design. Okay. I would reject the hypothesis that money had independently tossed each coin and each coin was fair. There are many other plausible mechanisms which are far more likely to produce that configuration. Some of these involve intelligence. Someone placed them that way. Some of them do not. For example, they may have slid out of a packet of coins without a chance to turn over. Now, leaving out the question of how you have to kind of carefully slide them out, um, 
and leaving aside the question of whether they started out all heads in one direction, which seems to be implied if you're going to do it that way, um, Nick Matsky then shows up and says what Mark said. And then he goes on to give another hypothesis, which is interesting. Another hypothesis is that all the coins have heads on both sides. Now, I would think that would not be a chance hypothesis. It wouldn't, be a fair coin. Um, it wouldn't exactly be a fair coin, no. Um, so, uh, S. Cordova reacted. Mark didn't answer with a simple yes or no. Is this the sort of answer you give your students if they pose the question to you? Well, what he says is actually, in some cases, no, I think is to be fair to him. The question was, would you reject the chance as a hypothesis for explaining the configuration? Two-headed coins is a rejection of the chance hypothesis. I think so, yes. Sliding out of a coin wrapper in the original configuration is a rejection of the chance hypothesis. And there's some little argument, we're not going to get into that particular one because uh, the argument is, well, are they all stacked heads up? And uh, does heads up or tails up, we'll get, one of them will give you all heads and one of them will give you all tails. So there's that much chance in the hypothesis. So it's a chance hypothesis if you want to say it that way, but I think most people would say that's not really a chance hypothesis. But anyway, having a robot mechanically order them is a rejection of the chance hypothesis. Having someone, space intelligent alien, some space, intelligent space alien, I'm sure that wasn't edited very well, configure them is a rejection of the chance hypothesis. You'd almost never hear such silly evasions in this discussion of simple statistics. You can't find it in yourself, Dr. Matsky, to say, yes, I would reject chance, as in some sort of random process, as an explanation. You'd stress irrelevancy, start talking about anything, rather than say yes. And then Sal pushes the uh, point a little further. The question was posed to see if you are agree there are certain patterns we can use to reject chance as a mechanism. Nick's response, no, but there are many chance hypotheses, not just one. And then he's going down and listing. Again, I'm trying to cut this to the chase as much as possible. You discover the coin is two-headed. Do you reject the chance hypothesis? No, because there are many chance hypotheses, just one. Um, and again, further down, 25. Sal said, two-headed coins is a rejection of the chance hypothesis. In response, Nick said, not really. <laughs> if the pattern of 500 coins all heads on the table is due to two-sided coin and uh, the next post he says, oops, I meant a two-headed coin, chance cannot be the mechanism for the pattern and even in principle since there's no chance for tails. No chance means no chance. The two-sided coin, again, two-headed coin, is the mechanism for the pattern if the, if the coins are two-headed. Now, I think it's pretty clear that, at least in that particular incidence, uh, Nick's, shall we say, stretching the truth a little? Should I discredit his entire commentary and everything else he wrote because he made a mistake? No. People are entitled to make mistakes. People are entitled to get their dander up a little bit and start saying no. It's a little bit like um, the cartoon of Bugs Bunny and the Empire, where the, um, the umpire says, you're out. And then Bugs Bunny gets into the umpire's face and says, I'm safe. You're out. I'm safe. You're out. I'm safe. You're out. I'm safe. You're out. I'm safe. And in the middle of it, Bugs Bunny goes, I'm out, you're safe, you're, I'm out, you're safe, I'm out, you're safe. And then they slow down and then, okay, have it your way, I'm safe. <laughs> um, it's real easy in the middle of an argument to start, you know, just being ornery. And I don't think that that discredits all the, uh, all the thoughts that you've ever had. 
And that's why I'm a little reluctant to go for the ad hominem. I would rather find the core and then go after that. Um, and uh, uh, he goes on, uh, goes on to say, but that won't stop Nick from saying not really, and it won't stop him from insisting no, because there are many chance hypotheses, not just one. Gee, Nick, if finding two-sided coins, again, two-headed coins, won't make you reject the hypothesis of chance, nothing will. Um, so the, the, the point is you can make mistakes. You can make serious mistakes. If they're not related to the core issue, they don't really matter. Um, now, here's, here's what I consider the core of the, of the book. And if uh, some of this sounds familiar to you, it should. The sudden appearance of multiple life forms in the Cambrian was a major unsolved problem for Darwin. That's the subject of chapter one. And the problem has only grown worse with the discovery of the Burgess Shale and the Changing fossils. That's the subject of chapter two. The excuse that the predecessors were soft body and therefore not preserved has been refuted by the evidence according to chapter three. That's a fairly specific claim. And claims that intermediates are really there and you don't really need that excuse, um, are lacking evidence and not believed by most authorities. And that, of course, is chapter four. Genetics seems to demand intermediates of common descent is assumed. Um, but the tree of life cannot be used as a counterbalance to the problem of the Cambrian explosion. It's not fair to say, well, the evidence should be there. Therefore, you, uh, it's, it's not a big problem because the problem is that the evidence that should be there isn't. The tree of life has its own problems. And punctuated equilibrium cannot explain the Cambrian explosion. So there are several points that he's making fairly specifically that could be run down and could be challenged. And it would be nice for somebody, if they're challenging it, to show from where in the literature this is actually coming from. The reason why the Cambrian explosion is a challenge for Darwinism is that Darwinism has to explain the origin of massive amounts of information, not just Shannon information, but functional information. That's from chapter eight. There's always been doubt that Darwinism was up to the job, but the work of Yaki, Sauer, and now Axe have made that job more daunting. Steve Meyer then wrote a paper that called attention to this work, only to see the paper put on a figurative index. Richard Sternberg to be effectively excommunicated. The only paper to attempt an answer to Meyer's article was an internet article, incidentally co-written by Nick Madsky. And Meyer takes the article apart, or at least he thinks he does. And we're gonna go back to that article because that's one of the central claims. Showing that the article's main peer-reviewed support doesn't sh show what the article says it says. New developments in population genetics have made more clear the magnitude of the barriers that are getting of, to getting even small changes of DNA that are advantageous, especially in multicellular animals, and developmental re gene regulatory networks, which can't change significantly without damaging or killing the creature, but must change to give rise to a new body plan. And epigenetic information also challenge Darwinism. That is the slow, gradual accumulation of mutations until you get a new organism. Several modifications of our alternatives to Darwinian theory have been proposed, such as self-organization, evo-devo, neutral evolution, neo-Lamarckism, and natural genetic engineering. Each of these has its weaknesses, which uh, Meyer explores in the book. And perhaps the most profound weak, common weakness is the inability to explain the origin of specified complexity or information. Intelligent design explains information well, and using abductive reasoning, standard in historical science, it is the best current explanation for the facts of the Cambrian explosion. It accounts for generating new forms rapidly, generating a top-down pattern of appearance, constructing complex integrated circuits, and reuse of parts in different settings. Intelligent design cannot be excluded from science by definition unless the definition is either ad hoc, that is to say it's specifically designed to get rid of, it, of intelligent design and nothing else, 
or it also excludes neo-Darwinism. Intelligent design is based solidly on science, unlike creationism. That's his statement. But allows one to believe in an ultimate purpose, unlike Darwinism or theistic evolution, which are also not based solidly on science. Thus, while evidence for intelligent, uh, this, while not evidence for intelligent design, although not based solidly on science could be, makes the question important. Now that's a fair summary of the book. It's obviously not necessarily what I believe because I think that creationism is based at least partly on uh, solidly on science. Um, but if I were to try to summarize the book in a very short time, that would be probably what it is. And it suggests several questions that can be dived into as kind of the core of what the book is claiming. So, that's the target. Let's see how well they hit it. Again, if you're going to do it, uh, let me just go over again the things you should do for a good review. Read the book, find the main ideas being presented, check them against your background knowledge, look up the references to other key ideas that you don't have enough background knowledge on, and then go ahead and write the uh, review afterwards. So here is one of the two major uh, negative reviews. It's very interesting. I wish I had the statistic with me. Uh, you'll see that this is a one-star review. The scale goes from one to five, and there are, I think, about three-quarters of the reviews are five stars. There are a, a scattering of four stars. There's like maybe, I don't know, three or four, three stars. There's another scattering of two stars, and then everything else is one star. It's just amazing to see the almost binary review pattern, uh, which suggests that people are giving it ratings not necessarily because they find the book useful but with weaknesses or um, useful in certain areas, but, but people are either trying to tell you that you should read the book or you should not, um, uh, which, is, which suggests that, uh, that maybe um, we're not dealing with people who are so much evaluating the book as trying to tell you uh, that you don't want to read that propaganda or uh, this is a really good book. Um, that will help solve the problem with in, your, in your mind. Um, but this is Donald Prothero's book, one of those two biggies. And uh, here it is. It's interesting, he starts out with the Bible. Now, that comes as a little bit of a surprise to me because elsewhere he'll talk about the Judeo-Christian God using a small, cap, uh, small letter for God implying that he doesn't believe in him. Uh, so why he's picking Proverbs and putting it there, I don't know. But whatever. Uh, and uh, he has a quote from Charles Darwin, and he has a quote from Shakespeare. Um, the Dunning-Kruger effect is a well-known phenomenon in psychology, first named in 1998, but it's been recognized since before the Bible and Shakespeare. In a nutshell, it is, as Bertrand Russell put it, the trouble with the world is that the stupid are cocksure and the intelligent are full of doubt. There's also another, now, so there's, there's one thing, okay? People who act like they know uh, everything probably don't. Um, now that sounds like, to me, it could cut both ways on, on a debate like this. Um, there's also another well-known psychological phenomenon, motivated reasoning. Our brains have many blind spots. And um, he talks about confirmation bias. And that, again, that's a double-edged sword. Could go either way. But he, he states it in a way that obviously, since he's giving a one-star review, is aimed at the other guys and not at him. 
The entire literature of creationism and its reference in offspring, intelligent design creationism, works entirely on that principle. A little too many entires, but minor point. Um, they don't like any science that disagrees with their view of religion, so they pick tiny bits out of context that seem to support what they want to believe and cherry pick individual cases. In their writings, they're legendary for quote mining, taking quote out of context to mean the exact opposite of what the author clearly intended. Sometimes unintentionally, but often deliberately and maliciously. So there's two complaints about creationists. Now you're going to get a taste of exactly who he's aiming at. He doesn't name names, but it's pretty obvious. Another common tactic of creationists is credential mongering. They love to flaunt their PhDs in their book covers, giving the uninitiated the impression that they are all-purpose experts in every topic. After all, I have a PhD. As anyone who's earned a PhD knows, the opposite is true. The doctoral degree forces you to focus on one narrow research program uh, problem for a long time, so you tend to lose your breadth of training in other sciences. That, it seems to me, also cuts both ways. Maybe Donald Prothero is too narrow. But uh, you know who he's talking about. They flaunt their doctorates in hydrology or biochemistry. Morris and Gish. That's who he's talking about. Then talk about paleontology or geochronology subjects. They have zero qualification to discuss. I have a problem with that. Zero qualification to discuss. Zero. It's not low, minimal. Um, does that mean that anything outside of paleontology, Prothero has zero qualifications to discuss? There is a, there's a problem here with seeing yourself as others see you, I think. I guess maybe it's a good thing that you're an MD because then you have a broader range and you, you, you can understand more. Hush my mouth. Uh, yes? Um. But, but what about those biologists at Emory who felt themselves, uh, how should I say, authorized to vet a neurosurgeon? Um, well, yeah, to vent what he had to say about growing up as a kid, even. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, it, it is just fascinating. You know, you need to have the original literature. But as you'll see as we get done, he quotes three books and one article as his references. Double standards abound. Now... I'll skip the rest on the uh, PhD, which is, you know, you can't fix a car if you're a PhD. Well, that's probably true, although not necessarily. There are some PhDs who can actually fix their cars. Um, Stephen Meyer's first demonstration of these biases, so now he's thrown, he's, he's railed against creationists because of all these things, and now he's throwing Steve Meyer in with him, was his atrociously incompetent book, Signature in the Cell which was universally lambasted by molecular biologists as an amateurish effort by someone with no first-hand training or research experience in molecular biology. Wait a minute. Universally? Well, no true Scotsman accepted his book. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Meyer's PhD is in the history of science. I have a hard time thinking of a more broad PhD. And a better way of understanding where science uh, holds still and where, uh, you know, where it holds water and where it goes wrong. Because you're looking at science from an overall view you have to be able to dive into specific subjects and understand them. So if I was picking somebody to write a book, I'd probably rather have somebody 
who had that qualification than I would somebody who had um, molecular biology. Uh, he'd deal with the molecular biology all right, but he wouldn't necessarily deal with the other questions that are involved. Um, so, but undaunted by this debacle of signature in the cell, by the way, you'll notice that Prothero doesn't have the qualifications to judge this. He's just going by all the other scientists that rejected it, right? I mean, after all, his PhD is in a very narrow area. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, my own profession, paleontology, I can now report that he's just as incompetent in my field as he was in molecular biology. Almost every page of this book is riddled by errors of factor interpretation that could only result from someone writing a subject way over his head, abetted by creationist tendency to pluck facts out of context and get their meaning completely backwards. Hmm. But as one of the few people in the entire creationist movement who has actually taken a few geology classes, and then he throws in, but apparently no paleontology classes. How does he know? He is their expert in this area and is happy to mislead the creationist audience that knows no science at all with his slick but completely false understanding of the subject. Now notice at first he was incompetent, but now he is incompetent and slick. And you're going to find out that he's incompetent, slick, and deceptive as we go on. Let's take the central subject of the book. Oh, good. We're actually going to get into some meat. The Cambrian explosion, or the apparently rapid diversification of life during the Cambrian period, starting about 545 million years ago. When Darwin wrote about it in 1859, it was indeed a puzzle. Okay, now, remember the first thing that he said, uh, or the first thing that Steve May Meyer said, was that Darwin found this to be a puzzle. I guess we can take this as confirmation that Steve Meyer actually knew what Darwin believed. So we have dived into the first part of the book. Oh, well, we haven't actually. In order to do that, you'd have to read Darwin. Um, but Steve Meyer quoted Darwin, you'll notice. And this guy seems to be seconding his opinion. And he certainly doesn't have the motive to second it because, uh, because he agrees with uh, Steve Meyer. So from that ad hominem argument, looks like uh, Meyer would come out with flying colors. But as paleontologists have worked hard on this topic and learned a lot since 1945, as I discuss in detail in my 2007 book, Evolution, What the Fossils Say and Why It Matters, as a result, we now know that the explosion now takes place over an 80 million year time framework. Ah, we have something to sink our teeth into. Meyer says five, maybe six million years. Prothero says 80 million years. That's a pretty wide gap. Paleontologists are gradually abandoning, hmm, the misleading and outdated term Cambrian explosion for a more accurate one, Cambrian sulfur fuse or Cambrian diversification. It sounds like there are a few people there who still, maybe, maybe even a majority, who still call it the Cambrian explosion. But our site's going to win, so don't worry about it. Although the Cambrian slow fuse, usually you think of a slow fuse as something that leads up to an explosion, don't you? Um, but whatever. The entire diversification of life is now known to have gone through a number of distinct steps from the first fossils of simple bacteria 3.5 billion years old to the first multicellular animals 700 million years old. 3.5 billion uh, to 700 million, that's way more than 80 million years, but why are we throwing that in? We're trying to, I guess, paint a broad brush so that we can see that the Cambrian explosion doesn't really happen. Um, we're going to dive into that more in detail when we get to Nick Matsky's uh, review. Um, to the first evidence of skeletonized fossils, tiny fragments of small shells nicknamed the Little Shellies, 
at the beginning of the Cambrian, 545 million years ago, uh, the uh, Nemeket, uh, Daldinian, and Timotian stages of the Cambrian, to the third stage of the Cambrian, Atabanian, uh, at, at I guess it is, 530 million years ago. When you, you first find the find, when you find the first fossils of large animals with hard shells, such as trilobites. Um, okay, where's that 80 million years? Let's see, let's supposing you start with 530 and you add 80, that would be 610. Where's 610 there? The math doesn't quite add up. Now, should we use that to de de uh, delegitimize everything that uh, Prothero says? No, I don't think so. He might be right in the other things and wrong there. It might be unclear there. Um, that's the danger of, of uh, picking on irrelevancies to make your point. But does Meyer rec reflect this modern understanding of the subject? No. Modern being, of course, Notice that not everybody's got it. Uh, no, his figures portray the explosion as if it happened all at once, showing that he has paid no attention to the past 70 years of discoveries. Boy, you know what would be really helpful would be to say, here's where the sponges came in, here's where the uh, Cnidarians came in, here's where the arthropods came in, here's where hallucinogenia came in, and so forth, and line them up and show that, you know, uh, it's really kind of a gradual thing that took place over 80 million years, or 60 million years, or 20 million years, or something like that. And say, and here are the references for these first appearances. You know that Meyer has a list of his references for the first appearance for all of those. Of course, he misunderstands his references, so don't listen to him. So he dismisses the Ediacara, I left a duplicate line there, fauna, as not clearly related to living phyla, a point that is still debated among paleontologists. Oh, he might be right about that. I don't think he is, but he might be. But its very existence is fatal to the creationist falsehood that multicellular animals appeared all at once in the fossil record with no predecessors. I think most creationists will say that they're multicellular animals. It's just that they don't line up as ancestor uh, going out to the various uh, phyla that do appear in the Cambrian. Even more damning, Meyer completely, now this is the worst, okay, or at least worse than what we just talked about. Meyer completely ignores the existence of the first two stages of the Cambrian. Nowhere are they even mentioned in the book or the index. I think I read that he said it started at, uh, after the Cambrian itself had, had started and that there was a distinction between the two. So why do you have to name those, uh, those people who know will know and people who don't know don't need to be burdened by those names that are difficult to read? And talks about the Atdebanian at stage as if it were the entire Cambrian all by itself. Is misleading figures implied that there were no modern phyla in existence until the uh, trilobites diversified in the at Debanian. Sorry, but that's a flat out lie. Well, we'll have to look at those figures again. But what I can tell you is that he definitely notes that there were sponges before the Cambrian explosion. And so is pretty close to a flat-out lie to say that he didn't think there were. It, 
Even a casual glance at any modern diagram of lice diversification demonstrates that, I, by the way, I was not able to find figure one, uh, demonstrates that probable arthropods, cnidarians, and echinoderms are present in the Ediacara fauna. Remember uh, that um, Steve Meyer went over those. And it's arguable that it's not. Remember, this is a point that is still debated among paleontologists. But he's going to use it anyway. I assume that he wouldn't have said that unless the majority were not on his side. Otherwise, he would say the vast majority or the majority or something like that of paleontologists disagree with that rather than saying this is, point is still debated. That's a polite way of saying, you know, the other guys actually are more than we are. Even a casual, uh, excuse me, even a casual glance at any modern diagram of life's diversification demonstrates that probable Uh, let's see. The phyla that he lists in figure 2, 6 as explosively appearing in the Advertanian stations all actually appeared much earlier. Or they are soft bodied phyla from the Chinese Chengjing fauna whose first appearance artificially inflates the count. Artificially? Well, more than I like, I guess. Notice that they all appear much earlier, or they are soft bodied. Well, if they are soft-bodied, then why don't we just say they're soft-bodied and so they don't appear? Why make it sound like they're, uh, they all appear? Why does their soft body somehow disqualify? Well, that's a problem. Uh, Meyer points out that there are layers where sponge embryos are preserved and you'd think that anything else that was there could be preserved at the same time. Now, maybe those things aren't sponge embryos, but it doesn't matter. Whatever they are, they are certainly uh, well-preserved fossils, which means that you could preserve soft bodies below that particular layer in the Cambrian. They're not there. Meyer deliberately and dishonestly distorts the story by implying that these soft body animals appeared all at once when he knows this is an artifact of preservation. Whoa! They do appear all at once, but we have an explanation. So when he says that they appeared at once, he's being dishonest. <laughs> now, notice that he went from being uninformed to being slick to now being dishonest. Um, it's just an accident that there are no extraordinary soft body faunas preserved before Qingjing. So Meyer's observation is correct. The problem is that his interpretation is wrong. Okay, and for interpreting things wrongly, he's being dishonest. Mm -hmm. So we simply have no fossils demonstrating their first true appearance which occurred much earlier based on molecular evidence. Now, I'm going to stop right there and ask you, oh, oh, wait, that doesn't that seem like he's conceding the point? But, but, but that sentence doesn't make sense. If there is molecular... Just a minute. I mean, excuse me. If there is molecular evidence, does that not imply that you have molecules? Well, okay. Let's go back to... Presumably. Let's go back to our quick review of Darwin's doubt. Think about this. Remember, Darwin was worried about this. The new fossils from Burgess Shale and then Chengjing made the problem worse because there are no fossils, that's <laughs> number chapter three, there are no fossils before that that look like they lead up to it. It looks like he's just conceded that chapter two and three are also accurate. Or at least the main points of chapter two and three are accurate. Um, yes. Uh, th this, I think, you know, uh, 
basic problem here is that uh, he's assuming evolution, which is the question of the book. When he makes that statement based on my career, they think, well, no, it would take so long to make these molecular changes that these organisms obviously lived hundreds of millions of years. In fact, you can find in the science literature a billion years yeah, before you find the fossils. Years I've seen uh -huh. before you find the fossils. Right. Uh, so th this is a very circular reasoning. So, well, the, but the point of it is, he's conceding the two points that Meyer made. Number one, that there aren't any f any uh, those fossils, and number two that there ought to be, based on molecular evidence, if you believe a standard Darwinian evolution. So he has now confirmed chapter four as being accurate. I guess if we're going through the book and using the ad hominem uh, route to argue, Meyer's coming out pretty good. Meyer's distorted in a false view of conflating the entire early Cambrian as consisting of only the third stage of early Cambrian. I didn't know that he did that. It seems like he made that distinction, but creates a fundamental lie that falsifies everything else he says in the ensuing chapters. You see, one lie, mm -hmm. you're done. He even attacks me, oh, this is personal, by claiming that during our 2009 debate, it was I who improperly redefined, it was re improperly de redefining the Cambrian. Uh, you know, it would be really nice if uh, he had put a link to that debate. Well, he, uh, he's obviously redefined the Cambrian explosion here. He's including the Ediacaran <laughs> stuff. Yes, yes. Isn't Ediacaran and the And then notice that he defends himself by referring to the peer-reviewed literature uh, right here. Even the Wikipedia site. <laughs> you see, if you're on my side, you can use anything. If you're on the other side, even if you have a PhD, it's not good enough. So the, the Wikipedia site will show that Meyer has cherry-picked and distorted the record. Sorry, Steve, but you don't get to contradict every paleontologist in the world, even the ones you quote in your book that sound like they, they agree with you on certain points. Oops, no, that's not every paleontologist in the world. It's, he's getting hot under the collar and he's just exaggerating. Ignore the early evidence for the first two stages of the Cambrian, redefine the early Cambrian as, the, as just a at, but at the Banian stage, just to fit your fairy tale. And then he goes on to say, even if we grant the premise that a lot of phyla appear in the at the Banian solely because there are no soft body faunas older than Chengjing in the earliest Cambrian. Oh, it is, see, number four, chapter four, the main point of chapter four and the main point of chapter three are in fact correct. There are no forms underneath. Meyer claims that five, six million years of the Adipotanian are too fast. And he says, wrong again, Lieberman. And that's one of the books he quotes, by the way, or uh, cites. Shows that rates of evolution during the Cambrian explosion are typical of adaptive radiation in life's history. Whether you look at the Paleocene diversification of the mammals after the non-avian dinosaurs vanished. Oh, so this happens all the time in the fossil record. That within less than 10 million years, boom. They, let's see, what else are they? Paleocene diversification of the mammals, diversification of humans. And so, you know, five to six million years, no big deal because it happens all the time. Doesn't it suggest that maybe the mechanism isn't good enough all the time? Mm -hmm. But see, this is the problem that he has. It's, 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 he's got faith that the molecular biologists have this all sewed up. Obviously, he doesn't have PhD training in it um, because PhDs are all 
narrow, including him. Um, and so he's just believing what they say he should believe. And so it shouldn't be a problem. And so it isn't a problem, regardless of how many of these explosions you find. Was there really a Cambrian explosion? Some have treated the boy, you know? Some have treated the issue as, as semantic. Anything that uh, plays out over tens of millions of years. This, by the way, is, uh, uh, who is it that? This is Noel. Uh, this is Noel, Andrew Noel. And of interest, um, this is quoting Noel. And notice that, according to Noel, 20 million years is a long time. Organizations who produce a new generation every year or two. Oh, I thought it was 80 million. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Pick your numbers. And then justify them. And then he has a little aside about how Myers talks about millions of years like an ordinary geologist might. I bet his young uh, earth creationist readers who refuse to co concede the earth is older than 10,000 years old are not happy with him for this. So he's talking to us now. Uh, we're supposed to be mad at Meyer because, uh, because Meyer doesn't agree with everything we believe. So we shouldn't read the book either. The mistakes and deliberate understandings and misinterpretations go on and on, page after page. Meyer takes the normal scientific debate about early conflicts about molecular versus morphological trees. Oh, that, by the way, is the subject of chapter six. The normal scientific debates about the early conflicts about molecular versus morphological trees of life as evidence scientists know nothing. Completely ignoring the recent consensus between these data sets. Boy, I would love to have his reference for the recent consensus. They have traditionally, the two are different and they've, it's not gotten better. The more they, uh, they have the molecular uh, DNA pattern and the uh, uh, traditional pattern classification, the, the more we sure that uh, the two are not matching. So there apparently were early debates that he's willing to concede. He just says now it's all consensus. So. Where is this consensus? Wouldn't, it, wouldn't this be a perfect place to put a reference to the peer-reviewed literature? But no. Um, he says he misinter completely misinterprets Eldridge and Gould punctuate equilibrium model and claim they're arguing that evolution doesn't occur. I don't recall. I think that he quoted them in their more grandiose introduction to this and then later on quoted that yes they use the same mechanism so I'm not sure that that's quite a fair criticism of Meyer um, not any support for any form of creationism including intelligent design creationism he repeats many of the other classic creationist myths all along debunked including the post hoc argument from probability you can't make the argument that something is unlikely after the fact. Whoa. You can't make the argument that something is unlikely after the fact. If you saw 500 heads of a penny laying there in a tray, can you make the argument that that's unlikely to be due to chance? I guess not, according to Prothero. Maybe his PhD didn't include math. Um, <clears throat> uh, which he, he goes on to say, uh, well, he says that uh, Golden Eldridge never cites that. Well, he did, but I guess Prothero didn't read the book carefully enough to see that. Um, Knowing that his math phobic audience is, uh, is easily bamboozled by misuse of big numbers. Mm. 
He wastes a full chapter on the empty concept of information as ID creationists define it. There is no such thing as information. Well, at least as the ID creationists define it. He butchers the subject of systematic biology, is in a normal debate between competing hypotheses to argue that scientists can't make up their minds. When that is the ordinary way in which scientists qu scientific questions are argued until consensus has been reached. But it'd be sure nice to know how, how that consensus was reached and what it was. Confuses crown groups and stem groups, botches the arguments about recognition of ancestors in the fossil record, can't tell a cladogram from a family tree. He blunders through the fields of epigenetics and evo devo and genetic drift as if they completely falsified neo Darwinism rather than as scientists view them as supplementing our understanding of it, which means that uh, Darwinism needs supplementation, I guess. Even if they did somehow shoot down some aspects of neo Darwinism, they're providing additional possible mechanisms for evolution. So you see, you've still got mechanisms, so it's still okay. In short, uh, something he supposedly doesn't believe in, you know, how do you define evolution? And that's why you can't use evolution without saying which meaning you're using, because it's too easy to argue uh, using that magic word that can expand or contract as you see fit. In short, he runs the full gamut of topics in modern evolutionary biology, managing to distort and confuse every one of them. That's quite a trick to do. In several places in the book, he shows his pictures of the Cambrian sections of China or talks in the final chapter about visiting the Burgess Sale in Canada, uh, as if to establish his cre street cred when he has at least got away from his office and computer once in a while. Uh, Okay, so if he'd actually done the hard work of learning about paleontology and doing research in the field himself, we might take him seriously. Of course, if he published uh, research, you know what would happen to it. It might be accepted by an editor who is open-minded and then retracted by the article, uh, or retracted by the journal. That did happen once. And then he recommends that if you really want to know what's going on, see the excellent book by Valentin and Irwin, 2013, which gives an accurate review of the Cambrian diversification. And notice that Valentin and Irwin were quoted in Meyer's book. And he, fi he says, finally, one might wonder what's all the fuss about the Cambrian explosion and why does it matter? Well, it's because the creationists operate by a God of the gaps argument. Anything that is not currently not easily explained by science is automatically attributed to supernatural causes. I think that's a little overstatement of the standard creationist position, but whatever. Even though ID creationists say that the supernatural designer could be any deity or even extraterrestrials, it's well documented that they are thinking of the Judeo-Christian God. So he doesn't like the Judeo-Christian God. And Therefore, this pointing out that the supernatural designer could be any, any deity or even extraterrestrials, which of course would not be supernatural, which means that it's not technically a, super, a theory of supernaturalism until you ask the question, where, where do we go from there, rather than simply, does it exist? Um, and they argue, this is our argument, notice, that if scientists haven't completely explained every possible event of the early Cambrian, science has failed and we must consider supernatural causes. Pushing our argument way beyond what I think uh, most of us would be comfortable with saying. Of course, this is a lie. Now it's flat out lie. For one thing, Meyer's description of the Cambrian explosion is distorted and false. Secondly, this God of the gaps approach is guaranteed to fail because scientists have explained most of the events of the early Cambrian and, he finds, and find nothing out of the ordinary that defies scientific explanation. Whoa. Okay. Uh, why, do they oh. call, why do they call it Cambrian explosion? Only a few details remain to be worked out. Other than that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? Uh, 
Unbelievable. As our fossil record of that time interval improves and we understand it even better, there will be nothing left for creationists to point to that might require supernatural in intervention. So you see, if you have the God of the gaps, the gaps will always disappear. And in particular, this gap will disappear and you'll be left holding the bag. So give it up now. <coughs> oh, we might point out the recent advances in science uh, counter that particular statement in that the epigenetic information, uh, the rates of mutation information, they're developmental going, gene networks. They're requiring more and more that there be a designer. Yes, I know. I know. But he thinks it's a losing strategy for us in every possible way. So he says, please, if you're as badly informed as he is, don't write another book showing that the ignorant are confident and the and the uh, uh, and the wise are circumspect. Now I have to ask, if you listen to this review, if you look at this review, does it strike you as a person who feels confident or does it strike you as a review by a person who feels mm -hmm. circumspect? Um, draw your own conclusions on that. Um, and then it finally he says that even though it's in paleontology subsection, it should be put in fiction. And there's the references. Now, I'm going to skip on, because I've said most of what I'm going to say. And uh, I, in the, uh, and uh, we've taken up enough time so that uh, I'm going to just turn it over to you now. Comments, questions, and it is after eleven o'clock or eleven thirty for those of you who need to know that. Just wondering if uh, the Institute of Creation Research, or however it's called, has done any critique because obviously they would have some differences with the Long Age. Um, we can look that up. That would be interesting. Uh, it would be it would be interesting to see how they how they react to it. Um, my own my own feeling, of course, is that I'm already giving some. I've given somewhat of a critique, and uh, will conti uh, continue to do that so that you'll at least get that creationist perspective. But My Myers did respond to this. Uh, I'll have to look at that. Um, it will be interesting. Um, obviously, if he did, it's not going to be. Um, presentable today because we've already taken up our time and then some. But it would be interesting to see what the reaction was. It's very interesting to see him describe himself when describe. If you read his his entire review, the criticisms he makes of others, he fairly well demonstrates the technique himself. It's amazing that someone would be that vehement that ugly and that blind to what he's doing and how that appears to anyone else. And yeah, without references, et cetera. It blanket statements. I mean he describes himself in what he claims the Christian the creationists are doing, what Myers is doing, amazingly well. You know, the the fascinating thing is there's those four references. Um, one of which is himself. Uh, one of which is to an article that I think uh, he cites and says what it is. Uh, but, you know, most of that stuff is completely gone. Meyer has notes for, I don't know, something like 80 pages or so. And that's coming with the note, you actually have to go to the bibliography, which is a little bit of a pain in the neck. But at least you can get back to the original data from which he got his material. Um, Prothero, no references whatsoever. And yet he wants you to take his word over Myers. I think that that's part of what's going on, frankly, is that he wants you to take his word over Myers so that you will never read the book to begin with. 
This is the thing that I think, you know, if I were dealing with a worthy opponent, I would say, you know, he makes this point and that point and the other point. I think he's wrong here. I think he's wrong there. And here are the reasons why. Um, uh, but I wouldn't say he doesn't know what he's doing. He's, you know, he's totally wrong. He's totally ignorant. And furthermore, he's slick. But at the end, he's confusing. It's, it's, it gets to be the kind of thing where, where, the, um, where the lawyer for the defendant is saying, my client didn't break your vase. First of all, he didn't borrow it. Secondly, when he borrowed it, it was already broken. Thirdly, um, uh, when he returned it, it was intact. <laughs> what, what strikes me is that he seems to really work from the premise that he is an authority in the field. And he speaks as the authority in the field. And how dare an interloper like Meyer have anything to say on the subject? It's, it's almost like, uh, hey, this is my field. You, you stay out of here that sort of uh, carving out the territory and this is our territory and you don't belong here. Uh, and this is what I've seen frequently from the evolutionists and they want to carve out ever greater territory, including territory over origins. And including territory over religion. Absolutely. And they want to basically um, eliminate religion from rational discussion. Uh, and while claiming authority on the subject. Yes. Uh, this is a very strange approach. It's... Uh... Well, when the facts are on your side, pound the facts. When the law is on your side, pound the law. When neither is on your side, pound the table. <laughs> yeah, as a librarian, I'm interested in credentials and who has what degrees. I think they're important, but not as important as Prothero is trying to make it out to be. Do you know of anyone in the creationist camp besides Gish? He's kind of out of, well, he's deceased He's now. deceased now, yeah. Anyone coming along that's a biochemist or a microbiologist who is really up on Darwinian genetics. Yeah, uh, I mean, it depends on how broad you define the creation camp. I know, camp. I know. Um, uh, but uh, I think that you could argue quite nicely that uh, Douglas Axe is in the uh, biochemistry and molecular biology area, uh, has done some very interesting work. Um, I think that you could argue that uh, Jeff McCumber is one, and Scott Minich is one. Good. Um, so a, a flat out creationist, I think most of them have been aiming at geology because they see that's where the, where the problem is. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact of the matter is that, that for example, the, the arguments that Douglas Axe made are equally useful to a long age or a short age uh, intelligent design advocate. So if these gentlemen that you mentioned Oh, were, and by the way, Sanders. Um, oh, yeah, Sanders. He's lectured on campus here. Yeah. So if any of these gentlemen you've mentioned, I wish there were some ladies in the group too, but Roger. any of these gentlemen <laughs> uh, that you mentioned, if... Gouger. Uh, what? Gouger's a lady. That? And, and. Oh, yeah. Oh, Gager. okay. Gager. Good. I, I need to be yes. corrected. These gentlemen and lady, and lady, if they were to in any way stick their necks out and imprint either on the internet or imprint in publications, endorse the work of Meyer, that would speak volumes on just on the argument that he's not qualified. You know, if they were to say he is qualified, that would 
that would really come through. Well, for, uh, remember, molecular biology, the argument is the signature in the cell is wrong. Right. So if you're looking for that, look at the dust jacket of signature in the cell. I'll have to go back and look at it. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, in, for Darwin's doubt, does he have any, well, let's say it's genetics, uh, plant breeding, biochemistry and molecular biology, biology. So we do have some. So we have some, we have some people in biology or, or, or molecular biology that <laughs> endorse the book. So, you know, it's not everybody. I think, again, this is Prothero going off on the no true Scotsman and knowing that anybody who stuck their neck out after he said that would get pilloried by the, the Darwin mob. True. Isn't that why you have extensive references? If you doubt what he says, if he's correct, you simply go to the <coughs> Well, see, that depends on which side you're on. If you're, if you're arguing for evolution, you don't need references because everybody knows. If you're Steve Meyer, then you really do need references. <coughs> but if you give them, they're not good enough. Also. Also, there's the argument that creationists, they use all of the material of evolutionists to undo evolution, which is not fair. They should be using creation literature, too. <laughs> which, of course, creation <laughs> literature is no good anyway because it's not peer-reviewed by no the good. right peers. Yeah. <laughs> so what it boils down to is you have, a, you, have a, you have a system that cannot possibly be falsified. <coughs> oh, I think it started with George McCready Price. Uh, the big argument against him, well, he's not trained in geology, number one. Number two, he would just ferret the literature and find all the negative things he could find and, you know, cherry pick. Yeah. Cherry pick his case and cite big authorities and then turn it against them. And they say that's not good science. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead and uh, well, I, it's disappointing to to see uh, th this approach and uh, rather uncritical, uh, using the term critical as analysis, uh, evaluation. Uh, science doesn't gain respect by this kind of activity here, and I'm. Uh, I'm thinking that, that science used to be a little more rigorous 50 years ago. Uh, right now, uh, it, it looks like uh, we're, we're publishing anything uh, anywhere and on kind of all kinds of places. There's not the rigor of, uh, and peer review uh, is not uh, being applied uh, fairly in many cases and so on. And I, I think as science wants to regain some respect, and it, it loses respect with this kind of uh, activity, uh, it needs to be a little more careful. And creationists have the same problem to a certain extent. They uh, have at times uh, been a little bit loose and so on, and it, it's not ended yet at all. But uh, I think we, we all need to be more careful uh, than this kind of activity. Yeah. I will say one thing in defense of Prothero, though, uh, and that is that this is an internet review. In fact, to be specific, it, was, it appeared on Amazon.com under the reviews of, uh, of uh, Darwin Stout, uh, which means that it's not a peer-reviewed review, interestingly enough. And it's possible that if Prothero had to put that into, say, nature or something like that, people would point out to him that you need to put a little more effort into supporting your allegations. Um, and it's one of the disadvantages of the Internet is that people can get by with sloppy stuff because there's nobody... I mean, if I wanted to write an interview, there's nobody that, that would look over my stuff and say... Uh, you know, you need to do this and this and this to make your review a little bit more 
a, a little bit more honest and scientific. And so with that, um, you know, I think one of the things you have to realize is that if you take everything on, uh, on the internet as being gospel, uh, you're in the position of the lady in the commercial who <laughs> went out with the Frenchman, <laughs> if you've seen the commercial. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, what, what strikes me if Prothero indeed feels as strongly about this book as he says, what strikes me is why the whole uh, effort to debunk it. I mean, I have read articles and papers which when we were reviewing in our group setting, I mean, we had laugh out loud sessions for some of the presented material. It never once occurred to me to write a critique to the editor and say, how did you manage to put that thing in print? Well, what were you thinking? All this kind of business. Uh, you know, this, this concept this is wrong, bunk obviously, and that as bunk here, and all and this. this is bunk and that's yes, bunk. Yes, that's it. You know, uh, this kind of stuff, you know, when th there is bunk published every day. As a matter of fact, I was just looking at the article. You mean you don't worship the peer-reviewed literature? Well, <laughs> if it's written well, if it's done right, yes, but not for its own sake. It, it is supposed to convey under new understanding. It's supposed to convey light, not confusion. So, but when you see muck, you pass it by, you leave it alone. The fact that he saw this book as something he had to fight means that he saw it as a threat. And this is the thing that I see from the evolutionists. They clamor that the creationists know nothing, they're no good, they do nothing, they know nothing, but yet whenever creationists or uh, intelligent design uh, protagonists uh, publish something. All of these guys jump on it with such vigor, it's as if they're fighting for their life. Are uh, you implying that he does protest too much? Uh, it seems to me that he protests perhaps too much. I don't protest so much against bunky material when I see it. I just try to do better, you know. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a strange thing, but, you know, in the end, good scientific literature will stand and bad will fall of its own weight. You don't have to undermine it. I have uh, two anecdotes. They're personal part of my own experience. I've never shared them here, but I guess I've never thought of sharing them. They're worth sharing. Um, creationism has changed, and I think Ardo Roth will agree that um, the attitude toward creationism has become um, more almost vehement. Some of the feelings, the anti-creationist movement uh, there was, I think, cordiality even um, toward creationists in one respect. If they good, do good science, then we'll at least acknowledge that they are scientists. Now that's kind of out the window too. Even if you do good science, among maybe especially a lot of people, if you do good science. That's right. So I'll give you an example. Um, I think it was 1980. The Geological Society of America met in New Orleans. You were there, Ario, and they had a whole session on creationism because I remember you were there and I was, I was just finishing my master's degree in geology at Michigan State. So anyway, um, 
at the end of the session, it was a morning long session, they entertained maybe 20 or 25 or 30 minutes of questions. So I wrote on a three by five card a question. I said, there are two kinds of creationists. There are the six day, 6,000 year creationists. And then there are the progressive creationists that say, we accept the fossil record and God did it over a long period of time. Are you addressing one of the two groups or are you addressing both as a concern? The moderator of the panel had an interesting response. The fact, I wrote the question, so I remember his response very well. He said, we don't worry about the He old picked yours out from all of the questions that were Yeah, playing. he had a pile of questions, so he addressed mine publicly. He said, we don't worry about the old earth uh, progressive creationists because they're in our camp. That's a very interesting very comment, isn't it? Especially for those who they're, they're not. They're on our side. We're worried about these, <laughs> these young earth 6,000 to 10,000 year creationists. So that was his response. I wish that response were in print. I don't think that was ever went into print. I, I don't remember? Think, no, I don't think there was any uh, yeah. written report of that, uh, of yeah. the details. Yeah, um, they, it's the too papers bad. that were presented. There were comments, but were no, 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 no report. Yeah. It's too bad that I people can, didn't have iPhones back then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember uh, Barghorn. I remember Barghorn there. Yeah. Getting up there and saying, creationists are just as crooked as a $3 bill. Yes, that was a famous statement of his. And... Uh, I can remember Lynn Margolis uh, pointing out some mistakes that creation had made, and I felt embarrassed. You know, I, we talked afterwards, I felt the same way, that uh, they did find some bad blunders that had been committed by creationists, and they did. Mm -hmm. Which yeah. means if you're going to be a creationist now, I think you, you really owe it to go back to the original literature, to read the quote yourself, to identify the page number exactly. and to read the rest of the chapters so that you know how that fits in a minimum of the you know a minimum of the less, the you know three or four paragraphs on either side so that you i mean and most of the time it will confirm yeah and it's worth doing and then and then when people say you took it out of context you can say no i don't read the whole thing read the whole thing. Uh, i'll give you an example i um uh, there's the famous quote from Luantin, uh, or Luantin, or however you pronounce his name, the, the, the one about we take the side of yeah. science in spite of all these things, and we do it because we cannot let a divine foot in the door. Um, if you read the entire article, that was the capstone point. Yes. I built up to that, and then it kind of, you know, followed from that, and when you quote that thing, you are quoting exactly what Lewontin wanted you to wanted you to see. And um, having read the entire review itself, it's not that long. You can read it. Um, you know, if I use that and somebody says you quote mining, I say let's go back to the original article. So. Um, Another point, another story I was going to give. Um, shortly after that, that was 1980, and around 1982, I was taking a class at George Washington oh, University. Before you go on, go ahead. One yeah. more thing. Yeah. Darwin's doubt is long age. It is. I guess long age is not protection anymore. Now it's open season. They're shooting at long ages. And yes. back then, the point I was making is they weren't really shooting at. ASA, American Scientific Affiliation. They weren't shooting at these guys then, you know. Yes, yes, but now this is intelligent design. Yeah, intelligent design is... is intelligent <laughs> design has a uh, completely different danger. Yeah, That's right. Well, yeah. no, they see yeah. it as part of the same danger. That's why they call them intelligent design creationists. They see intelligent design as far more dangerous than creationists. Well, the, you know why? It's because creationism, you can attack the creationism for their beliefs. 
The intelligent designs don't state any beliefs, so there's no way of attacking them, so you have to defend yourself, and they can't do it. They can't do it. Good. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, the second anecdote is 1982 or thereabouts. I was taking a class in micropaleontology, and the instructor was uh, I.G. Sohn. Um, he was just about ready to retire then, but he was a top 20 or top 10 authority in micropaleo back then. So this, I, this is like uh, uh, pollen grains and stuff? And so, no, this would be um, uh, forams and ostracons. We mostly, deep, the ooze, the deep sea ooze, he had samples. He worked at the Smithsonian. And so I was the only student enrolled, and he knew I was from a Christian college, Columbia Union College. So he was very open about discussion of religion. He's Jewish. He's deceased now. He's been deceased for 20 years or more. And, uh, so you so can't we, ruin his reputation here. And we had a lot of open discussions, and we talked about origins right there in the lab as we're working in the lab, origins. And um, he said, you know, I'm a polyphyleticist. Polyphyleticist. I think I mentioned this once before to this group means that uh, you had multiple origins for all the major phyla, you know. Which means the Cambrian explosion was real. It was real, and there's no predecessors. He would agree with, yeah, Meyer. Mm -hmm. He would agree with Meyer on that point. And he said, my colleagues at the Smithsonian, he worked at the Smithsonian, plus he taught at George Washington, my colleagues call me a creationist for saying there are multiple origins because it just couldn't happen the Darwinian way and it couldn't happen by chance. And we talked and I wish I ha had done an interview or written this up or something, but it's very enlightening. And he was well respected. You know, he was an old earther, old earther, but he was a creationist at heart. It would be very interesting to resurrect him and have him give a review of this book. Yeah, okay, I wish I could. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think that would probably finish what we have here, unless somebody else has a comment. And uh, we will see you next week, and we'll take on Nick Matsky, and we'll try to see if we can uh, put in uh, maybe responses to Prothero and, and Matsky.